All right, so chapter five introduces you to the importance of small business and entrepreneurship in our economy and in our society. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little extra <clears throat> information on, on franchises and uh, what's hot today and, uh, and, and what's really kind of involved in all of that. So let's first start with uh, small business. And there's a lot to this particular screen, but um, we're running on a definition that it needs to be a business that's owned and operated. In other words, you have to be the owner and the manager of the business, okay? It's operated for profit and it's certainly not dominant in its field. It's certainly one, it's a, one of many companies that are in uh, the field that it is. Small businesses are, are extremely important. I mean, of all the firms that are out there, it represents an enormous uh, percentage of them. Most businesses that you and I deal with are small by comparison. <clears throat> by comparison, we have these huge multinational corporations that have, you know, thousands of stores and hundreds of thousands of employees and so forth and so on. Um, small business has its own definition. You might be surprised by the definition of small business. It doesn't necessarily mean you know, you started a, uh, a lawn, you know, a leaf blowing, lawn mowing, you know, landscaping company. And, and that's, a, that's certainly a small business, but you'd be surprised how they define small business in the United States when we talk about small business. They can be actually look quite large to some people, uh, although most small businesses are, 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 pretty, are pretty small. Uh, they do employ a lot of folks, uh, about half of all the employees uh, that are in the private sector, which means not working for a government or a public sector, uh, are employed by smaller businesses. Uh, they do have a very large payroll. They are really good at creating new jobs. Um, and they've always been an engine of growth for the economy. Uh, and so they are reflected in, in that. They are, uh, because a lot of small businesses have their own little niche, um, they tend to employ a higher uh, percentage of high tech workers, folks that are in the sciences, engineering, uh, tech industry, et cetera. Uh, and that's because a lot of folks have ideas that they're, that they're running with and, uh, and making a business around uh, some invention, some other types of things. And so there's a lot of creativity in, in, in the sciences and engineering uh, type of group. Um, over half of them are run out of the home. Their home-based businesses and uh, and a very small percentage of fri franchises, which we're going to be talking about uh, later. But even though it's a small percentage, franchise is still a very popular way of getting into or starting a business for for some people. Um, and so again, and they're very very innovative. They're 16 times more patents per employee. Now, a patent is a uh, an invention, you know, an ownership of an invention. And so this goes to the fact they have a lot of high tech, um, you know, scientists, engineers, IT people, they, they're inventing new things and starting businesses around those. So you might have an invention and, you know, a business could be started around that invention uh, and that does not happen. So here's the issue that I told you that you might be surprised in terms of, of how small businesses are defined. Um, and so they basically had, and this is from the Small Business Administration, they basically indicate there's two standards that are widely used. Um, 500 employees for manufacturing uh, and mining industries. Um, that's a lot of employees to consider small, but it's small in manufacturing and mining. <laughs> okay. In terms of, of wholesale uh, trade, another big area uh, where there's a lot of small businesses, they run about one to 200 uh, employees uh, for those small businesses. But small businesses run the gamut. They're in all different types of industries, uh, as you see here, from, uh, from farming and agriculture to retail trade, uh, barber, beauty, salons, uh, cosmetic, other types of things, construction, uh, certain contractors, and so forth and so on. They, they basically run the gamut. Uh, of course, almost all of them started with 
you know, very, very small size, one, two, three employees might have been a family business uh, or a small partnership that has grown. But uh, these are uh, these are our definitions. So again, like I said, it might surprise you to know that um, that small businesses, even on a, a company that has 500 employees, if it's in manufacturing is considered small. Um, and so that's one of those interesting things. I think also too, it might help you understand uh, some reports that, you know, the PPP that was passed by Congress for small businesses. Uh, and some people were just like aghast, like, oh my God, these are large corporations. Well, again, if they fit into the, the basic uh, definition, then they technically are small businesses and thus were eligible for for those types of things. But I think when you and I talk about small business, we're really looking at the, you know, the small shop in the plaza or some, you know, small office uh, building and as, as someone who's doing something there. Um, and that is also small business, but it's certainly not the only way to look at it. Lots and lots of small businesses uh, in, uh, in the United States, as we see here, um, just to kind of know that you know, this small businesses have a hard time surviving. And so the fact that uh, earlier this uh, decade from 2014 to 2015, 80% of those small businesses actually survived for, you know, into the next year, uh, that's really remarkable because um, a lot of small businesses don't really survive that long. It's very, very difficult to have a business and, and have it survive. Uh, for a long time. So again, here's some of your averages for the for the 10 year period listed here. Um, you know, 78% survived at least a year, about 50% survived five years or longer, and only about 33% survived 10 years or longer. So as you see, it's a it's a difficult uh, and competitive area. Um, starting a business and having a business is exciting. Um, but at some point in time, for a lot of people, it's it it, it ended. You know, and of course, we're seeing that accelerating this year, 2020, with coronavirus and all the factors that really just put a lot of people in business over the edge. You know, they just couldn't possibly stay in business. Sometimes uh, starting a business re only requires um, a smaller investment. Um, but oftentimes um, you have to have something special that you're offering, but oftentimes it doesn't really take a, a ton of money sometimes to start a business. Sometimes it does require more than you have, uh, particularly uh, if the product or service is really unique and, and there's interest and you're going to need to grab more money somehow. But, uh, but basically speaking, you know, when you start up something, it doesn't really need to have a lot of money. Like if I wanted to start, you know, a landscaping business, uh, I already had a few tools at my disposal. I would need to purchase other types of things uh, to start it, but it's relatively low uh, initial investment compared to starting other businesses. So, you know, in general, it's not that bad. Uh, they look at the types of, of industries or what they call the three broad categories of industry that small businesses generally fall into. So retail, wholesale, you know, things like this are, are part of distribution. They are usually involved in moving goods uh, around the economy, either business to business or business to consumer. Uh, the other is, is probably the biggest is service, you know. Um, whether it's financial or not financial, um, the service uh, service businesses are, are usually quite popular to start because a lot of people can do things like provide a repair service or provide hairstyling or uh, other types of things and they wanna get into that. Others are, are providing bookkeeping and accounting services. Some might be providing real estate or insurance services. So those are very popular and, and are part of the service sector. And there are some that are in uh, production, either in specifically in manufacturing, they make a product, uh, or they construct buildings or other types of structures, or they're, they're in mining. And so um, these are sort of broad categories of industry that your book uh, looks at here or introduces you to. 
Entrepreneurs are important because entrepreneurship is necessary to, you know, we need people to organize things and, and get things done. And entrepreneurs are the folks that we usually uh, look into uh, or, or count on. And even though this is particularly um, focused on entrepreneurs as business people, there are social entrepreneurs as well. Entrepreneurs are not specific to the business world, um, but you can have someone who, you know, starts a charity or, you know, organizes uh, uh, social or, or, you know, uh, activities like a, you know, a baseball league or something like this. Um, those are social entrepreneurs as well. Uh, so entrepreneurship is, is a broad category. This particular book is looking at it specifically for, um, for small business and why people go into business for themselves. Uh, certainly you kind of need that spirit. Um, you're okay with independence. There's a lot of freedom. Uh, yes, but you know, with that freedom comes a lot of responsibility. A lot of people look at just one end of that argument, which is, oh, I, I have a lot of independence and freedom, but there's lots of responsibilities to be independent. There's a lot of responsibilities to that freedom. Uh, and entrepreneurs have to be good at both of those. Um, so again, they, they, they have a, they have a strong determination. Uh, and belief that they can do certain things. They are very much seeing challenges as, um, as things that they want to tackle. Uh, in some cases, um, you know, there's a lot of this different motivation to do that. And sometimes uh, family background matters, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and of course the age, uh, we have this, a lot of entrepreneurs are you know, between 25 and 45. Uh, most of them, 70% um, specifically. And so, you know, it, it's really the sort of that perfect age where you do have a lot of independence, you have a lot of energy, you have a lot of motivation, determination, et cetera. It's harder to do that when you're older. And it's, it's getting more common to do that. We have a lot of teenage entrepreneurs, um, but, you know, it's, it's harder to do that when you're, when you're younger. Um, but it is, it does happen. Um, small business owners come in all different um, demographic groups. Uh, Women-owned businesses are, are growing. Um, so at least a third, a little bit more than a third of all small businesses are, are owned by women. Uh, in terms of actually having a home-based business, women own two thirds of home-based businesses, which, you know, for a lot of folks make a lot of sense. They can have a business at home uh, and they might, you know, be carrying other responsibilities where working out of the house makes perfect sense for them. There are, you know, 10 million women-owned businesses in the U.S. Um, that's a lot. And they, and they generate a lot of, of revenue, you know, 1.4 trillion. Uh, this is uh, 2017 data. Uh, 1.4 trillion dollars in sales is certainly nothing to uh, uh, to sneeze at. Um, but in, in essence, the interesting thing about uh, women-owned businesses is actually they are more financially sound and creditworthy. A lot of women take this stuff extremely seriously, um, and so more seriously than than men, they don't make as many mistakes in these areas, and so their risk of failure is lower. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of self-employed women are older, um, have uh, a good amount of education, and they actually had experience before they started their own business. And that's another thing that people have to balance. You know, when you start your business, when you don't have a lot of experience, you're going to make a lot more mistakes. If you have a lot of business experience before you decide to work for yourself or start your own business, that experience now becomes a very important asset for you to use because you'll have all those lessons sort of in the bank. Um, teenagers are, are rapidly increasing their footprint in, in small business and entrepreneurship because they have a lot of ideas. And, uh, and a lot of those ideas are, you know, based on their comfort level with, uh, with technology and other types of things uh, similar to that. And so, you know, it, it's very, I mean, Facebook started when Zuckerberg was in college, he was a teenager. Basically, when he said, "Hey, you know, we can set up this little network where we can, 
you know, share pictures and information and have friends. And, you know, look at it today. I mean, it's incredibly large. Um, and so a lot of folks who are younger have some really, really great ideas that can, uh, can, can really turn into a business. Um, and a lot of people that come here from other countries are sexually hard workers. Um, and so they can start, you know, they, they oftentimes will bring whatever skill they have with them here and they'll start working for themselves for, you know, out of a number of different reasons. Um, and they work really, really hard to make sure that they can succeed. And uh, that's true for most immigrants uh, in general. And, and so entrepreneurship has been very much a way in which immigrants kind of make their mark and whether that's, you know, uh, setting up, a, you know, a culture-based restaurant or, or they already have a particular skill in, in one of the trades or something like this, you know, you're setting a business up around that is very, very helpful. But of course, there are there's failure everywhere. It's part of life. It should not be uh, life should not be looked at as just success, 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 and no failure. Failure is normal. Failure is just a, a normal part of life. The purpose of it, of course, is for you to learn. You know, are you learning from the times that you might have fallen down? But you get back up again, right? And so that's really important. You know, failure is uh, is a learning tool. Well, for entrepreneurs and small businesses, really that lack of money and being able to pay the bills um, uh, on a regular basis, you know, that cash flow is really the amount of cash needed to come in every month to pay the bills. Sometimes that cash flow isn't there, but the bills stay there. So if you don't have any cash and you, and you can't pay your bills, then it's, you, you, it becomes a real big problem for your business. And that can contribute to failure. Uh, again, a lot of folks uh, are doing this without a, not a lot of management experience and a lot of management skills, and so that can also rely to bad that re that can lead to bad decisions. <clears throat> excuse me, and that can lead to failure. And some small businesses are are you know they take the challenge perhaps a bit too zealously. They they want to expand. They have some success in one area. And they want to go, go, go. Let's expand, expand, expand. And sometimes, you know, expansions are always a good thing, but they need to be planned. You know, rapid growth needs to be managed. Otherwise, it can collapse on itself. So this idea of overly expanding uh, can lead to failure. Um, this particular table shows a number of years and, you know, the, the amount of new businesses started in thousands compared to the amount of businesses that closed that year. And as you see, it's, you know, depending on the year, it, it's, it can be pretty, uh, look at 2009 where we had that collapse, um, 409,000 businesses started that year, but um, 494,000 businesses closed that year. And that was a bad uh, year in the economy. As you know. And you're gonna see the same thing lopsided this year for 2020, so many businesses have closed, um, you know, with, with the pandemic hitting us hard. Um, businesses, small businesses are very, very important, mostly because this is where most of the innovation is taking place. Um, large companies are slow to innovate. They do research and development. Some are quite good at innovating. Uh, but some are actually, you know, sitting on their laurels a little bit too high. We think we have fast internet here in the United States, but if you go to Japan or South Korea, um, you're going to scratch your head like, what? Why don't we have this? Well, probably because we don't have a lot of competition in that area. And so when there's a lot, a lot of, uh, a few businesses that don't have a lot of competition, they don't innovate. They don't innovate because they feel comfortable. So small businesses have to make a place for themselves in that. And thus they become really very, very innovative companies. And uh, that changes the world. So we really kind of need them in our economy um, for, uh, for this. So a lot of the um, new technological advances have come really out of small companies, you know, and they just kind of that there. So it's really important. Small businesses are obviously important because they are a source of employment. Um, a large percentage of workers 
um, are, are working in small business. As a matter of fact, for first jobs, oftentimes small businesses are providing people with their very, very first job. And small businesses, because they are investing in that, they, they really uh, want you to do well, want you to help them. So they pay more attention to their employees in that regard with, with training and so forth. Um, small businesses provide competition. Again, very large established firms, uh, you know, can be uh, slow to react to customers. Uh, small businesses provides that competition where larger firms say, well, if we don't do it, they're gonna go somewhere else. And so uh, that competition is very, very important to how our economy functions. And of course, the role of businesses is to fulfill needs that society and other, uh, has in general, whether it's individuals or other businesses. And, um, and small business are, are right there. And so a lot of, um, for example, a lot of parts and uh, supply dealers are involved in, you know, getting uh, parts and, and other things to General Motors to build its cars and trucks. And look, General Motors relies on more than 32,000 different companies for parts and supplies. A lot of those companies are small business. There certainly are some advantages of having a small business uh, because you're the owner operator, you're gonna have a lot of great personal relationships with customers and employees. And so that personal relation, those personal relationships matter both to you and to your customers and employees. And so that's a big advantage there uh, because you're small, you should be nimble. You should be able to adapt to change more quickly because there's uh, less folks involved, less people to bring on board, et cetera, to, to adapt to those changes. And so, you know, you can uh, adapt to various changes quickly. Uh, record keeping is quite simple. You know, you, uh, you certainly are, <clears throat> uh, have a lot of independence, you are independent and have a lot of independence. Uh, so you structure your day uh, accordingly, but of course it's gonna be all around the business. Uh, if there is a profit, you keep it. You know, oftentimes uh, it's relatively easy uh, with low costs of going into business most of the time or going out of business. And of course you can keep all your information secret because it's a small business. But of course there are disadvantages, um, including of course the risk of just failing. It's higher for small businesses. And so um, not something new, doesn't, but we, we are, we encourage risk in our society. And so, you know, this is one of those types of things. And one of the risks, of course, is you could fail. Uh, there's certainly limited potential um, for a lot of small businesses, particularly if they're just sort of built around one person's skill, you know, at doing something, whether that person's a great chef or that person's great at, you know, at some other services being at hair or skin or whatnot, you're kind of limited to that because it's hard to kind of grow from, from that. And of course, money. Um, you're, you're very, very limited to, to raising money that you need to keep the business uh, going, keep it, keep it growing, things like that. Uh, however, you know, there are folks that are, it's become pretty interesting that a lot of folks are not just relying on traditional banks and other things to get money. Uh, other sources include angel investors. So these are private individuals who literally invest money in a small business. They get ownership for that. They get ownership stake uh, for that, um, but they are considered angel investors in that regard because they are really there to help uh, both the small business survive and to make a profit for themselves. And the other thing that's really interesting is crowdfunding. Um, so again, you know, you can go to Kickstarter, um, you know, and I think that, or Indiegogo, uh, and basically, you know, you can help raise money from, from folks, you know, contributions that get, you know, the business, uh, going where it's going. So it's, it's very interesting. I, I mean, it's, this is one of the, those tech conventions that it doesn't always happen in, uh, you know, back, back in the day, but it is happening now. As you see, for most entrepreneurs, um, their personal uh, access to money um, 
relying on bank loans and relying on friends and relatives are the top three ways in which they grab money for their business. Uh, I think this is relatively risky unless you, you have awesome friends and relatives that don't mind losing money. Uh, because again, the risk of going out of business is there. Once you start a business, uh, one of the most important things you can do is do a business plan. Um, and a business plan basically is a guide for that person starting a business. It's, it's an excellent thing to do. Uh, matter of fact, we do have a class that, that has a business plan, which is uh, the small business management class that we offer um, in the department. And so again, a business plan has very important uh, purposes because it tells every it tells you and, and gives you an idea of what your um, you know what the purpose of your business is, um, how things are going to be managed, and what the plans are. Uh, there's a lot of parts to it. Your book sort of has this in a table um, in terms of what you're going to be doing and and how what's one of the different parts of a business plan. And again, I, it's just an intro here. Uh, but if you're really interested in putting one together. Uh, it's highly recommended. I mean, I think that it's one of the most important things um, business people can do. If you're even thinking of starting a business, you want to write a business plan to think it through. It really is about planning, thinking it through. And that gives you the experience to manage things better. So again, uh, what type of, uh, what's the nature of your business? What's the mission? Um, why is this a good idea? What's the goals? How much is it, you know, going to cost to get it kick started, et cetera? Um, there's a lot more parts to it, but certainly it is important. Oftentimes, um, banks and others, you know, if you're looking for loans for as a small business, they often will see how organized you are, how much planning you've done. A business plan would help you. The Small Business Administration is part of the federal government. Um, and this particular agency really helps um, assist and counsel and protect the interests of small business in the United States. They do have a lot of courses and workshops. They have individual counseling centers for, uh, for management advice, conferences, workshops, and all types of publications, um, sba.gov, if you want to look at the site. Uh, at some point in time. But it is, you know, it, it is a resource. It is a resource. Another thing that's a resource is the um, um, the Service Corps of Retired Executives, or what we call SCORE. Uh, and it's basically, you know, a, a ton of old timers, uh, retired and active business uh, people, managers that have worked for corporations and have a lot of experience, whether it's in accounting, finance, marketing, or whatnot. And they're providing um, counseling and mentoring to entrepreneurs and small business owners. Uh, it's a great organization. It's a great part of the SBA. Um, they also have, you know, Minority Business Development Agency. Uh, again, there are there's there's money here and increased opportunities. There's also the uh, the Online Women's Business Center, which again provides specific information for women-owned businesses and the challenges there. Um, and of course, there are institutes and development centers that tend to be university-based. Um, I think Marist has one, a small business institute there. Uh, and basically these are to help develop um, businesses within their, their students and the community, okay. Um, SBA is, they don't, I mean, they actually guarantee loans uh, for banks. So the, the SBA will guarantee uh, a loan if people would need a loan, they would go to the bank. If they're backed by the SBA, it's sort of the bank says, okay, well, if, if this person can't pay, the SBA is going to come in <clears throat> and pay part of that or all of the loan. And so it helps businesses, small businesses get loans, which are important. And the average size of the loan is uh, 300,000. That's something to, to sneeze at. And it's paid back over a period of eight years. So it's just information type of thing. Um, all right, let's go to uh, franchising and the highlights of, of this. So a franchise is literally a license um, to operate 
as an individually owned business, uh, uh, one of the company's um, stores, such as a McDonald's, H&R Block, uh, Amco Transmissions, um, some of the, you know, some of the bigger, I mean, one of the hotter franchises this past uh, decade, particularly the last five years has been like Chick-fil-A, they're popping up all over the place. Um, but there are franchises in every, you know, category. Matter of fact, you have uh, gas stations, you have hotels, those are all franchises. Um, and believe it or not, if you're a sports fan, I don't know if anyone's a sports fan, but um, the NFL owns all the teams and grants licenses for franchises. So the Giants are a franchise of the NHL. The, uh, the yes, are the, um, the National Football League. The National Football League granted a license to the owner to operate the, the Giants. And that's, of course, why if the team is up for sale to another buyer, the, uh, they have to approve it because it's, it's a franchise. The, uh, the, the actual league owns the team and the owners of the local teams are basically franchisees. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. But franchises, uh, franchising is an important aspect because they tend to be a little bit more successful than opening up your own business uh, on your own. So franchising is the granting of that franchise. Um, you get that from a franchisor. So they are the organization granting the franchise. If you bought a franchise, you're a franchisee. Okay. Uh, the franchise is, supplies a lot of things. Um, they have the advertising down. They help with management. They give you the training and materials and they give you how to do business. So they've sort of written everything. You're buying a contract that includes your promise to do certain things, part of that contract. Um, as a franchisee, you're going to be the one who supplies the labor. You're also going to supply the money to build it uh, and to finance it. You're going to manage it. And you have to agree to the contract. The franchise agreement is the contract. And this is one of the problems that happen with, um, oh my God. Um, Buffet, what's that buffet thing called? Golden Corral uh, on Route 9. That was a, that's a franchise. And so they originally opened, uh, but the owner wasn't following the franchise agreement. So the franchisor said breach of contract, pulled the franchise, which is why it closed. Then they sold it to another franchisee who is abiding by the franchise agreement. And so it was allowed to reopen. Um, I don't think it's open now. I think, I think basically it's hard to do a buffet style restaurant during a pandemic. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think it's, op I don't think it's open and operating right now. Um, so again, you're, you're signing a, uh, you're signing a contract and these contracts are exceptionally detailed stuff. And so, you know, you can use the trademark and the train name of the franchise. You can do a whole bunch of other things. You know the secret methods of what makes it, you know, successful. Um, but it's a contract. If you, if you do not abide by the contract, it can be pulled. You lose that investment. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a little bit detailed, okay? And there's a lot to it here. So uh, again, you know, basically the three categories of franchising, one is about a manufacturer authorizes the franchise. So we have that with the automobile industry. So um, General Motors or Ford is the manufacturer and then they authorize who gets, you know, a franchise, which is basically the retail store. You and I go shopping at these. Uh, retail stores to buy cars and trucks. So uh, the retailer technically is a franchise. And it was the manufacturer in this case, you know, General Motors or Ford that granted the franchise to, to the local folks here. Um, a producer, you know, licenses a distributor to sell a product. And so this is, this is how Coke and Pepsi run. Uh, Coke and Pepsi are producers but they provide a, a franchise, a bottling franchise to local 
uh, folks, and they're the ones who actually make and bottle uh, the Cokes, the Pepsis, and distribute them to stores and so forth. Um, and then the one that we're going to be talking a little bit more about is the brand name type of franchiser. So whether it's Avis Rent-A-Cars or a hotel firm or a Subway, um, you know, it, these are the ones that you are granted the brand name and technique uh, to offer a complete product. You have to, uh, you can only do what they do. Dunkin' Donuts is a franchise. You could only sell at Dunkin' Donuts what is a Dunkin' Donuts completed product. Can't make up your own stuff. So, um, so it is one of those types of things. Franchising is very, very steadily growing. Um, it's very, very popular. And I'm gonna show you some of that stuff right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring this down here. Are there any questions while I'm transferring uh, stuff? Okay, so I'm gonna show you some things that are going on in franchising right now. Okay, so first thing is uh, Forbes magazine's um, list of the best franchises to buy. And this was just most recent 2020 uh, article. Um, as you see, they, they listed this to a high investment, medium investment and low investment. So for these high investment types of things, they have a bunch. So I don't know which ones you are familiar with. Uh, but I think almost everybody is familiar with Planet Fitness out of all of these, and maybe Hand in Stone, because we have one. And certainly there's, there are Marriott's and Panera breads everywhere. Um, and so as you see here, there is, uh, there's, a, there's an initial investment that has to be made. And look at it for Planet Fitness, $2.6 million has to be made. Um, that's for, if you want to purchase a franchise, you got to have a certain amount of money to make all of that stuff work before they grant you the franchise. Uh, look at the, uh, look at the Marriott town play suites, 16 million. Even me. Hand in stone is the cheaper one here. I right? know a little more than a half a million dollars. And, you know, you can start massaging people's faces uh, immediately, you know, uh, close to it. Right. Um, so these are the top 10. Let's look at the low end, the low investment, see if anybody uh, recognizes any of these types of things. Maybe Made Pro, you might have seen. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen any of these other ones. I don't know what soccer shots are, but good Lord, um, we can take a shot at it. Let's give it a kick. <laughs> uh, well, it's a very low investment. Look at that. The low, only 47,000 has been the initial investment on average. So that's really small amount of money to go in and get a soccer shots franchise um, to, to get or a made pro 100,000 relatively small amount of money. Um, well, what you agree to these things, let me just increase the size of the, uh, print here, so it'll be a little bit easier. Let's say you do want to have a Planet Fitness, um, and this is from Entrepreneurship Magazine. Say you do want to have a Planet Fitness franchise. Well, they have some interesting information about uh, how it started um, and, and things that have. So look at this, this middle investment here, the cost of actually getting it down, right? So the initial investment cost runs anywhere from, let's just round it from one to $4 million, one to $4 million. Uh, they've obviously have been increasing a lot uh, in, in the future. Look, they have a very, very large uh, increase, 15% over the at last year, uh, over the last three years, 65% growth. So obviously it's a, it's a relatively hot franchise. Um, it's based in New Hampshire. And look at the financial requirements if you wanna be an entrepreneur, right? Look, your net worth has to be $3 million. You have to have one and a half million dollars in cash available for the franchise. And then this is what you are agreeing to as well in the contract there, you pay an initial franchise fee. So just to actually be granted the franchise, uh, that application process, 20 grand for the application. And then what are you going to uh, agree to after the application? Well, uh, you promise them 7% royalty fee. So this is 7% of all your revenue 
is going back to the original company, the franchisor. You are also are going to participate in their advertising. And so 9% of your sales are going back to the company to support uh, its aggressive advertising. Okay. Um, so that's 16%. So out of every dollar you're collecting, 16 cents of it is going back to the franchise, um, the franchiser, because they are providing uh, you with a bunch of things. So what type of things are they providing? Okay. Uh, of course, they do have some financing options for equipment, because for, if you're going to do a plan of fitness, you need a lot of equipment, and that's not cheap. Uh, but let's take a look at the support. Again, I'll try to make this a little bit larger here. Uh, look at the support that they do provide, right? They do have uh, purchasing co-ops. They have a newsletter, uh, meetings and conventions, a toll-free line, grand opening support, online support, security and safety procedures, site selection. Uh, they'll help you with software and an internet platform. Uh, and then for marketing, they're going to be doing advertising for you. They'll help you with the uh, ad templates. If you're going to do some local advertising, they do national media and regional media, social media. They'll develop your website, develop your email marketing, and give you the loyalty program app. So again, there's a lot that they are, are providing you for exchange for those fees that you're taking. And this is a continuous thing that they do. Um, on the job training and classroom training is required. You need to be certified at various things. Um, and again, you're going to need a number of employees to run a franchise between 12 and 15 employees you need to have to run a franchise. And so there's a lot to running a franchise. Let me go back to the original list here. Let's see if I can pick out another one. Um, there's a lot of them here. Um, and again, uh, this is Entrepreneurship Magazine. They have franchise, uh, a home page. They have a quiz, some business opportunities for franchises that are, are for sale, uh, et cetera. Ace Hardware is a franchise. Uh, Planet Fitness is a franchise. Jersey Mike's, so that popped up. Uh, I live close to Fishkill, and that popped up in Fishkill. Whether that, what did that person have to do uh, to get one of those? Well, the initial investment for Jersey Mike's is anywhere between one hundred and sixty and eight hundred thousand dollars. They're obviously aggressively growing over the years. Um, so the initial investment is given. Well, your net worth, you don't have to have a very large net worth, right? So the person has to be worth at least three hundred thousand and they have to have one hundred thousand in cash to put it together. A franchise is going to cost them eighteen thousand five hundred dollars to get a franchise. And then they have promised to pay an ongoing royalty fee of six and a half percent of sales is going to go back to the franchiser and then a 5% fee for royalty for ads. So it's for ads. So here they have 11 and a half percent of every dollar, 11 and a half cents out of every dollar that they sell is going back to the franchiser Jersey Mike's uh, in, in uh, as part of that agreement. Well, what do they get as part of that agreement? Again, they have pretty much the same type of support options, right? They do have newsletters and meetings. They have a toll-free line, help with grand opening, online support, blah, 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 site selection, software, things like this. And then a ton of advertising support that they're going to be doing. Um, that's what you're paying for. That's what those royalty fees are about. That's what you're paying for. A lot of job, obviously 360 hours of job on-the-job training. 40 hours of classroom training, and you're going to need to have 10 to 15 employees to open up. Okay. Now, this is interesting. They do have this note called absentee ownership allowed. Um, that wouldn't, I mean, that would that would miss the classification of a, of a small business because to be a small business, you have to have someone who's the owner, also an active manager. So the fact that they allow owners that don't actively run the shop. That's an absentee ownership allowed. They, in other words, I can buy a franchise and set it up and have someone else run it, hire everybody, and I just don't do anything. I just look at the books periodically because I invested in it. Um, that's allowed for Jersey Mike's. That's not allowed in a lot of other companies. 
So uh, it's interesting. I'll go back to the list, maybe look at one more. Pizza Hut. <laughs> 7-Eleven, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of them. Uh, this is interesting because this, this is a tutoring center, right? Kumon Math and Reading Center. Um, you know, you would think that how much you would need, well, obviously a little bit less. Your initial investment is less, uh, between 75 and 150 grand. Um, you need 70,000 in cash. It's only a thousand dollar franchise fee. And then there's an ongoing royalty fee per student per month you're sending back to the company. Um, and then they have certain, they have a lot of support options that look a lot like the other ones, but a lot of training clearly. And you need two to three employees to get this up and running. You can include yourself. So again, less uh, necessary here to, to do that. Um, there's Baskin Robbins, this, the, all of these, Smoothie King, which we have one in, in Roppingers. Um, uh, great clips, which may not be so great. So let's take a look. Um, well, actually, it's not that bad. You need uh, one hundred and fifty to two hundred eighty thousand dollars up front. Uh, net worth, you need a lot and, and a good amount of cash too. Uh, Twenty thousand to get your franchise, and you're giving up eleven percent in royalties, ongoing and ads. Um, so th there's, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. I wonder if in Smoothie King would be more, cause there's a lot more equipment here. There's a lot, lot more equipment here for Smoothie King. And again, absentee ownership is allowed to do this as well. So I can just, I can buy a franchise, but hire other people to run it for me. I never have to show up for work, you know? Uh, but I'm going to need a lot of money to do that. <laughs> so... Um, so I, th I think it's one of the more interesting areas. I'm back to the big screen now. I think it's one of the more interesting areas. Uh, franchises, you you are working as a, as a small business, um, but you have agreed to go by all the rules in the contract that's already been set by the company. The company has those rules and products and how things are done because they, they think they have a very successful formula. And it's easier, in essence, to do that than to start your own business. If you start your own business, you're going to do all of that yourself, right? So it, that they do tend, franchises do tend to have a higher success rate in general because it, of all that support. But you are given up, obviously, a part of every dollar and sometimes a big piece of every dollar back to the franchise or um, in, in, you're paying for that support. Right. It's part of the contract. The McDonald's, uh, you know, it's very, very thick. It's a very, very thick manual. You have to follow everything, including how many time, how many minutes a burger has to be cooked on one side and when it's going to be flipped to the other. What machines you're using, how much ketchup, mustard, onions, and pickles are supposed to be on every burger. It's exact. <laughs> you can't be making up your own stuff there. Um, it's very exact. And so it's a contract. And they have a right as a franchiser to cancel that contract if, as a franchisee, you're breaching that contract. So, but obviously, you need a lot of money to get that started, some more than others. All right, there's your, there's your tour. How'd it go? Okay. Reasonable? Okay. Thank you, Nick. And I'm going to stop the recording.